Hello, it's Damon the Global Gardener here in Seattle at the Beacon Food Forest. It's a seven acre farm that is planted by some of the people from the University of Washington. It's right on the edge of the border of the horticultural area and it's a food forest for the public and so it's the only other one, seven acre one, is it's like 7.1 acres is in Atlanta, Georgia. So. Here we are at this one. I was here five years ago and it's it's definitely grown up quite a bit. Everything is ripe and lovely. I see kiwis and grapes and raspberries and I saw it's uh, end of June and there's some ripe blueberries on the blueberry bush here. The food, the what is a food forest and why a food forest? They have an entire layout of the food forest living web. A web of life food forest is designed to link food crops together in a web of life similar to that of other forests and it engages all the critters of the forest in the gardening tasks for fertilizers and things like that uh, there, and it goes into pollinators uh, there's a mason bee house housing over there that we'll go look at in a minute it talks about all kinds of different bugs and their interactions and how they help fruit grow. I'm hearing a crow nearby in the kiwis. And what are you doing, Mr. Crow? He wants to be on video, I suppose. Hello. Thank you for helping in the garden. Eating fruits and converting them to fertilizers. Or maybe, maybe it's a writing exercise because he's on the, on the wire. Well, that's fun. Hello there. Yes, what else? What else do you have to say to the viewing audience? That's what I thought. Okay. Very cute. Uh-huh. Alright, and then so worms, fungi, and other soil life eat the detritus and, and mushrooms and turn it into the compost that feeds the whole system. And then uh, food forests, because there's canopy trees and a multi-layer other life that it all builds on itself and helps to make it all healthier. There's the minerals being broken down and pulled into the roots because of the, all the different decomposers and the bacteria in the soil. Uh, there, there's uh, water storage from all the organic matter soaking up water and, and also uh, dropping all the rainwater back into the groundwater to recharge that and it, and it cleans the water on the way through this whole system and slows the water down is what this part is saying. Slows it down so that it can infiltrate and uh, helps also break apart rock and, and helps decompose things and feed all the life. So just wandering through here, well, I promised you we'd go see the, the mason bees. So, uh oh, but I see before we get really anywhere are some of my favorite fruits, which are the golden raspberries. <sighs> oh, you think they're just yellow, but they're actually golden. And they're so delicious. Mm. I actually like them better than the red ones. They get a little bit of a pink tinge to the tips of them when they're really ripe. Well, that's cool. This is a Iliagnus umbellata autumn olive. And I, I tasted a fruit on here. And when I first got to the Beacon Food Forest, and it was <laughs> kind of bitter. Um, they probably get riper and better. Or ah, oh, here we go. These are very simple mason bee boxes. They look sort of uh, like weapons or guns, um, and it's just really straws. It looks like these are paper straws stuffed into PVC with a cap on it. I'm sure there are other, even just any kind of wood um, that doesn't have to be PVC, unless you have some waste PVC that you'd like to 
contribute to the mason bees, but mason bee box. These boxes are part of an ongoing research project through the University of Washington. They are blue orchard mason bees. Wow, that's cool. Blue. Stingless and gentle and pose no danger to children or those allergic to bee stings. These boxes are being monitored and analyzed as part of a research project investigating the impact of urban landscape composition on the health of native bees in the Pacific Northwest. Do not disturb or alter these boxes. They are being monitored by the University of Washington. If you have any questions, please contact the principal researcher, WESTR097 at uw.edu. There you go. Seattle Parks and Recreation, University of Washington, Blue Orchard Mason Bees. That's super awesome. Uh, I see some plum trees. I see a nectarine. And there may have been a late frost because I don't see that, that uh, uh, froze the flowers because I don't see any fruit on the, the nectarine there. And I do see some of my other favorites are Jerusalem artichokes. These get quite tall and put out sunflower, multiple sunflower heads. The heads aren't so big and they don't really produce seed, but the roots taste like sunflower sprouts. They're absolutely delicious. And they'll just keep spreading around and making a beautiful sort of sunflower patch if you don't dig them up and spread them out or, <coughs> or, or eat them. <coughs> I'm eating too many things and talking too fast without drinking water because this is a freaking awesome place. And what you got there? Gooseberries. Lots of them. Mm -hmm. Oh, those are good. Mmm. Gooseberries are different. That's a good one. Those are, they're big too. From other gooseberries that I've seen. Other gooseberries are a bit smaller. And this is like, as big as I'm trying to show you, as big as my finger, but it's hard to hold the camera and show you that at the same time. But I'll just sort of try to Generally, put this right to there. Yummy, delicious. And then you see all kinds of clover in here. You got this nice clover. You got vetch in here. Vetch has all the seeds and, and some pretty pea like flowers. Those are nitrogen fixers. And so all this soil is being built up quite a bit by having the nitrogen fixers just brambling around. And I see lovage, I see uh, weeds, I see, wow. Well, there's a bunch of mint in here, which is a kind of a uh, beautiful weed. Um, um, here are these giant convolvulus in the morning glory family. Ouch, that just prickled me. That's a Himalayan blackberry. No, that's a, uh, uh, yeah, that's a Himalayan blackberry. Uh, I was, I was hoping that it was the thornless one, but obviously it just grabbed me. Um, if you don't know about Luther Burbank, do some research on him. He, uh, brought in <laughs> Himalayan blackberries and they're weedy all over the Pacific Northwest from, they're probably up in Canada too, down to, I don't know how far down in, in uh, California, most of the way. Um, they grow really well, they're very weedy, and they make delicious blackberries, but they're also hard to get rid of once they get established. It takes some serious goats munching away for a while to really shred them. Um, I see some strawberries just ranging around. Strawberries and mint are a great combination. There you got strawberries, um, there you got mint. And here you have horsetail. Equisetum uh, is if you if you you can grind it up and either ferment it or just put it in in water. And, and if you're having a fungal issue, the the horsetail herb or um, equisetum will uh, it's high in silica, so it'll help to uh, do some reverse. It brings in sunlight, so it'll uh, against fungus. It's it's quite a helper. Oh boy, we got some medicinal stuff here. What is that, mugwort or motherwort? I always get those confused. And then the beautiful and illustrious calendula. 
amazing potent herb very useful in many ways for either skin care or um, lots of different things here's a giant patch of thimbleberry they look like raspberries but they really only make a tiny like shallow cup more like a thimble than a raspberry here's more pollinators that we're approaching it's like beware of dog because it barks it's like beware of oh look at all the bees in there i don't know if i can zoom in but they're swarming about the hives can you see those beauties they're doing the pollinating and uh, also of course have the secondary wonderful functional crop of honey to enjoy uh, let's see I'm going to another part of the garden and I will resume in the next video please subscribe to see a lot more fun and adventures around the world. This is Damon, the Global Gardener.